Hello, everyone, and welcome to McGill Care's webcast series, Supporting Family and Informal Caregivers. I'm Claire Webster, a former caregiver, certified dementia care consultant, and founder of the McGill University Dementia Education Program. I work with a dynamic team of leading healthcare professionals to oversee the program who include Dr. Jose Moret from the Division of Geriatric Medicine, Dr. Serge Gauthier, McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging, and Dr. Gerald Fried, McGill Steinberg Center for, for Simulation and Interactive Learning. Today's webcast is made possible thanks to the generosity of the Lindsay Memorial Foundation. Our topic will be frontotemporal dementia and managing challenging behavior. My guest is Dr. Simon Duchamp. He is a neuropsychiatrist and a clinician scientist at the Douglas Mental Health University Institute at the, and the Montreal Neurological Institute Hospital. Dr. Ducharme is the director of the McGill Division of Geriatric Psychiatry and Neuropsychiatry, as well as the director of the American Neuropsychiatric Association Committee on Research. Welcome to McGill Cares. Thank you for the invitation, Claire. Well, I'm very, very happy to have you on because uh, frontotemporal dementia is a topic that uh, many people would like to learn more about. Um, you know, so uh, I thought, how about reaching out to one of the leading experts in Quebec on the topic, which is yourself? So to begin, um, perhaps you can tell us what is frontal temporal dementia? Sure. So frontal temporal dementia is part of the dementia family. So when we talk about dementia, we talk about all these diseases that affect intellectual capacities like memories, language, and that are progressive over time. So we usually talk about Alzheimer's disease because it's by far the most common form of dementia, but there are others, including frontotemporal dementia. The particularities of, uh, I'll call it FTD, which is the acronym for frontotemporal dementia, is that uh, it affects the frontal part of the brain, which are, uh, we call the frontal lobes, that are the centers for most of what we um, think when we think about behavior and personality. So the symptom profile is different from Alzheimer's because it, it tends to be more prominently changes in personality and behaviors, and it can also include changes in languages. Uh, other uh, things that are important to know is that it tends to be a young onset dementia, meaning that it usually starts uh, before the age of 65. So typical age of onset would be 40 to 65. And it's unfortunately a degenerative disease that is progressive over time. And what causes this? Is there any correlation between concussions or unhealthy eating? Like how do people develop this? Yeah, so that's, that's a very important question. So we know in the brain uh, what happens is that there are a few changes uh, there's some proteins in the brain that start for various reasons to change in shape, and that becomes an issue for the brain leading to the symptoms and the degeneration. In terms of what causes these changes, uh, one important uh, part is genetic. So in FTD, there are about, about a quarter of patients in which we can identify an abnormal gene that runs in families that causes the disease. These are what we call dominant mutations, which means that if you get the mutation, you're essentially certain to get the disease at some point in your 40s, 50s, and 60s. So that explains about a quarter of all the cases. For the remainder, uh, unfortunately, we have very little knowledge about why someone, a uh, specific individual, developed that disease. As you mentioned concussion, it could potentially be linked to it, but it would explain only a, a very small fraction of all the cases. The other association we see is that there's a group of patients with the disease who also get uh, the disease we call ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And I think you talked about that in, in the webcast at some point. Uh, so there's a link between these two diseases in terms of the, the brain changes that we see. And, and, and so you can see, have both diseases, but there's a big group of patients for whom we, we don't know why they got this disease in the first place. So how do you diagnose FTD? So 
I mentioned there are two major presentations. There's one where they're called a behavioral variant. So this is a disease where most of the symptoms affect behavior and personality. So the diagnosis is based on the clinical symptoms. And what we look for is a pattern of specific symptoms appearing together. So usually we'll get some changes that are what we call insidious in onset. That is, they gradually appear over time. There's not a set day at which they start. It's a very, very gradual process. And we'll see changes such as um, loss of judgment. So people who make uh, unusual mistakes in judgment or lack filter in their interaction, or also the changes we call apathy, apathy, which is a loss of motivation, initiative. So the individual might withdraw from social interaction. There might be changes also at a more emotional level. So less emotional interest for other people, uh, disengaging from relationship. And so these symptoms tend to appear together, become worse. And this is associated with what we call cognitive problems. So intellectual uh, decline, like a decrease in capacity for organizing, for sequencing, for executing tasks. And so when we see that profile together, there's a, a certain number of symptoms we're looking for. Uh, that is suspicious for a behavioral variant of FTD, uh, which we will then go and confirm with uh, brain MRIs or something called an FDG PET scan, which is a nuclear medicine brain scan. There's also another type of presentation uh, which affects language. And so we call those the primary progressive aphasia. So it's in the same family, but the presentation is completely different. So these individuals will have change in uh, the capacity to recognize words, say words, construct sentences. And this will be associated with a little bit of changes in behavior, but the dominant thing is that they lose the capacity to understand and uh, produce uh, language. Now, because FTD affects a younger group of people, um, I, I guess that oftentimes people could mistake it for depression, right? So yeah, so that's a very common mistake. So when we look at the symptoms, particularly at the behavioral variant, we're talking about things like, you know, change, decrease in motivation, decrease in interest, uh, less engagement and relationships. So when you, you think about someone who is 45 and developing these symptoms, your first thought is not going to be, oh, this individual has dementia. You'll think it could be a depression, maybe it's an anxiety issue, maybe it's just a, a life crisis, the person is, is unhappy, maybe it's something related to alcohol or substances. So mm -hmm. the usual process will be um, for the person maybe to, to be seen by a family doctor. And often there's a referral to a psychiatrist. And we see that in about half of the cases, the initial diagnosis is, is what we call a primary psychiatric disorder like depression or anxiety. And, and this can be sometimes a, a mistake. That is, uh, people miss the signs of FTD. There are also cases where the psychiatric changes are the correct diagnosis, but they will evolve toward uh, an FTD dementia. Now, because I work with so many families who are, you know, going through this, um, you know, some when you were saying lack of judgment, or are there also conspiracy theories? For instance, you know, people accusing their spouses of cheating on them or stealing, or uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of error, like financial errors occurring. Does that fall into that category? So that's a bit more unusual in FTD. So the, the first part that you've described, these paranoid tendencies are more common in Alzheimer's because they're also related to the forgetfulness. I forgot where I put my wallet, so it must be someone who stole it from me. There's that kind of reasoning. Whereas in FTD, there's much more indifference and lack of awareness about the symptoms. So, so one key component to be aware for the behavioral variant is that in almost all the cases, the person suffering from the disease has no awareness that there is something wrong or that they have a disease. And so it will more often be indifference rather than you know, proactively accusing others of cheating, lying, stealing. Okay. 
And so what would be the major difference between so FTD and the other dementias like Alzheimer's? Because it's, yep. is it, or, and, and is it possible to have both like FTD and Alzheimer's? Possible, but quite unusual uh, because FTD starts a little bit earlier on in life usually. And so at this age, you don't tend to have a lot of Alzheimer's changes, let's say at, at 45. So it's a bit unusual to, to have both. Um, the big differences are uh, in, first of all, in symptom profiles. So if you look at the typical changes of Alzheimer's, it's going to be problem with short-term memory, forgetfulness. And the behavioral changes are there, but they're usually a little bit later uh, down the line when the disease is more advanced. And at the beginning, the, the person suffering from the disease will have some degree of awareness that they are forgetful. It's not usually not perfect, but they, they, they pick up that there's something wrong. They might deny it. Uh, but in FTD, the behavior is really at the forefront. It's what dominates, even uh, if when we do, let's say, memory testing, it might be perfectly normal at the beginning. Mm. And there's much less awareness of it. The other big changes is, uh, of course, what's causing the disease in the brain. It, it's very different uh, changes that we see on what we call the autopsy under the, the microscope. And, and the last one I mentioned is also that the, uh, the genetic causes are much more common in FTD than in Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So doing genetic testing is, is a much more routine practice in FTD, whereas in, in Alzheimer's, we usually, unless there's a very, very strong family history, we usually don't test for that. Oh, I think it just froze there. Oh, we're back. I'm back. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, you're back. <laughs> um, so my other question would be now, like, how does the disease evolve over time? Okay, what, what, not, like, what would be some of the more challenging uh, behavioral, and are there also physical changes that take place? Yeah. So it is a, a degenerative disease. So that means that the brain changes will get worse over time, and that the symptoms will get worse. Uh, Unless the person also has ALS, uh, which I mentioned earlier, which tend to be very aggressive diseases, let's assume we have FTD as the only diagnosis. It is a disease that will evolve over several years, um, five to 20, sometimes 25 years. So it's a, it's a slowly progressive disease. And what we will see is that the, the behavioral symptoms will get worse. So the loss of motivation will become more and more profound. The indifference will become more and more uh, severe to the point where in more extreme cases, there might be a, a complete lack of interest, let's say for one's own children, because we're talking about people who are in their 45, 50s, they might have relatively young children. So I've seen patients who literally lose their capacity to um, emotionally share with their children. Or engage um, in activities, I guess, like attend conversation, a conversation. Exactly, attend attend yeah. a basketball game, or you know, show interest if something sad happened in the day. There, there might be a mm -hmm. very uh, severe blunting, which is very very difficult for for family. Mm -hmm. um, the also the, the the intellectual problems will get worse. So at some point, there will be more forgetfulness, more difficulty talking. The physical part comes usually toward the end. So you can have some gait issue, you can have some symptoms that look like Parkinson's, but that's usually uh, you know, several years down the line when you reach the, the more severe stages. So when you're saying gait, you mean walking? Walking, um, balance. Walking. So balance. They, they could have falls, they can have stiffness. Uh, so shakes, that, any type of tremors or shakes as well? Or? That, that's not a common symptom. So okay. You can have it, but again, these are usually advanced dementia situations. Okay. So now um, as, these, as these symptoms progress and let's say that, you know, the filter goes out, right, for the symptoms in there, you know, unfortunately they, they, they lose their filter and what they say and what they think. Yeah. What happens, like, what is the role of alcohol then? I mean, because I get that question a lot, you know, um, because some people say that they they try to use alcohol to calm down their loved one, but then at mm -hmm. the same time, alcohol may enhance some of these behaviors. Yep. So one thing to know before I answer directly that question is there's one symptom that is peculiar in that disease is that the patients will have 
um, what we call hyper orality. They, they, they consume things through the mouth and it can be a lot of food. So it can be sugary food, fatty food, but it can also be alcohol. It can also be smoking. So there's, there's kind of a, a, a rage to eat or drink. And so that can be a, a behavioral issue where the, the patient with the disease will want to consume excessive amount of alcohol without really realizing why they're just drinking a lot. So in that situation, we would want to restrict the access to alcohol because there's very little intervention that can stop that, that, uh, that pulsion. Um, in terms of using alcohol to calm, probably not very advisable because it can also lead to um, losing inhibition. And so we have patients who are already maybe lacking filter, might be intrusive, might get in trouble because of that. Um, you wouldn't want to add you know, an alcohol uh, overuse on top of that. It, it will probably make things worse. So let's talk about um, treatment. Um, so what would be some you know, pharmacological methods and some non-pharmacological methods? Is there a way of like, slowing the progress of this disease? Yeah. So in terms of the, the treatment for the disease per se, there's unfortunately there are uh, no available options. So uh, in Alzheimer's, you have the symptomatic medication like uh, the Aricept or Donipazil that have modest efficacy for symptoms. In FTD, we, we don't even have that. So when a diagnosis is made, unfortunately, uh, there is no intervention. So we use medication or non-pharmacological intervention to uh, either try to uh, contain symptoms, so make them more tolerable, easier to manage. Uh, and we use you know, the, the uh, prevention interventions like controlling blood pressure and diabetes and exercise. These are all goods for brain health, but they won't stop the FTD process. Okay, so when you're saying the pharmacological, it's more about if the behavior becomes too difficult to manage, is it like kind of like anti-anxiety medication, that type of medication? Yeah, so the, the first thing is to, to reach uh, a clear diagnosis. So one, but when we know someone has, let's say, a behavioral variant of FTD, the first step will be uh, to sit down with the family to really explain what's that disease and why the person is having those uh, behavioral changes to develop a very clear understanding that the person is, is not aware that they're doing this. They don't have a, an insight or recognition that they are ill. They're not doing this to manipulate or um, get back at someone. So we try to um, decrease these misunderstandings and once we know this, then we carefully determine what requires an intervention or not, because there are some symptoms that might be annoying, but that aren't really causing a problem to the person. Let's say being very passive or wanting to watch always the same TV shows, that's not harming anyone. That's not a, a, a symptoms for which I would like to intervene with a medication. This is more about knowing you know, the disease and, and letting go. Uh, but we will intervene when there's aggressive behaviors. Uh, anxiety will usually be expressed more in terms of what we call compulsion. So the person might be doing very intense rituals, always the, the same thing. And that can create some problems, either uh, leaving the house to go on, on these very long walks where they might get lost. That's, these are situations where we will try to intervene um, first with uh, non-pharmacological options, but sometimes we use uh, medication. So yeah, anti-anxiety medications or antidepressants can help with this, uh, the compulsive aspects when it's more agitation, it's usually more low doses of antipsychotic or mood stabilizer, very similar to the approach we use in, in the behavioral issues of Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so now let's give some advice to family caregivers or informal care partners. Um, how could they best manage this, this disease of their loved one? Um, let's talk about behavior and let's also talk about how do we keep them safe? Yeah, um, so the, the first part about the behavior is to um, uh, 
manage the expectations. And so the person has this disease with behavioral changes and gradually the, the, uh, the, the, the person is kind of changing. And so there's a grief that happens at the beginning where it's not the same person. It's still my husband, he's still there, but it's not the same person anymore. And I don't wanna, as a caregiver, burn all my energies trying to find back this person. So there, there's a grief process that needs to happen. Um, so that the caretaker can um, select the areas where it's essential to intervene. Um, so ensuring a structure for you know, basic things like bathing, eating, I've mentioned, uh, sometimes you need to restrict which food comes in the house because the person can become obsessed with eating Sugar. ice cream or honey or yeah. sugar and so they could mm -hmm. if, if there's two kilos of it they will go through two kilos mm -hmm. so you need to um to bring less uh, in the house the when you get into more um physically disruptive behaviors pushing biting that's often where we use medication again these are symptoms that are in the more advanced form of dementia. It's not at the beginning, but we, we do see that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what about keeping somebody safe? Like what recommendations would you have with regards to driving or at yeah. home? What could they do? Yeah, um, so safety will depend on the profile of the patient. So there are patients who are, who become very passive. And so these are patients who can you know, be left alone for a prolonged period of time and will be okay because they'll mostly watch TV or do Sudokus. And so there's, there's not a lot to do for safety. Whereas you have patients who are very uh, impulsive and, and lack filter who will tend to go out and, and get in trouble talking to strangers or um, in those situations, what you want in terms of safety, things like uh, having a medic alert bracelet to indicate that the person has dementia, because it might not be obvious to the person who talks to the individual for two minutes in the street or to the police if they are called. Mm -hmm. um, using um, apps for uh, a cell phone with an app to know where the person is, uh, because it's, it's a common thing in these patients to enjoy doing things like walks, where they, they will do very long walks, always in the same uh, areas. And so if you prevent them from doing that, you're making them worse, but at the same time, you wanna ensure their safety. So uh, tricks like, um, like this. And then for the caretaker, uh, it's very important to get help early in the process uh, mm -hmm. because the, these are demanding patients. And as I said, it's, it's a long disease. So it's not something that you do for a year or two. It's a much longer process than that. So involve the family, involve friends, involve community organisms, the, the Alzheimer's Association um, to, to get services or help at home to avoid burning out. I mean, one of my primary objectives and messages has been to families that, you know, you need to become as educated as possible on the disease and seek support early, as you yes. say. Yeah. Now, one of the challenges, however, is that, especially I, when I see among for the spouse, the spouse says, oh, no, I can manage it. You know, nobody's going to care for my loved one except for me. And then sometimes it just takes a crisis to occur before the caregiver actually gets some support. You know, at, at what point during this disease should, uh, would it signal to the caregiver that, okay, they can't do it on their own anymore? Like at what point? Um, I would say as early as possible because you don't want to reach that point where things are either breaking down and it has to go through the hospital for the patient or the, the caretaker becomes uh, sick uh, from, uh, you know, overworking, uh, taking care of the, of the spouse. Uh, when we definitely start to consider a need for um, external help, uh, when you start having issues that are more physically demanding, so if you need help, the person needs help for, for bathing or washing, and, and that becomes uh, more physically difficult. Um, when also the person needs 24-7 uh, supervision. So at the beginning, patients with FTD can sometimes stay for, as I give the example, could stay an entire day at home 
and you know within constraints one phone call this can work but as the disease progresses, someone might need to have someone with them all the time and, and that becomes excessive even for the most uh, devoted spouse and it, it, it's it's a very common situation that there's tremendous guilt in uh, in, in the 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 caregiver uh, and we I, I try to work with them to to you know, explain the nature of the disease and the importance of, of getting help and that, you know, the disease will take its course and uh, you, you cannot save the person. And so you want to maximize positive intervention. If you're a caretaker and you're 24 seven with the patient that has behavioral issues, it's not going to be positive interaction. So it's better to get some external help and, you know, you spend more quality time with the with the person. Also, patients with FTD, as I mentioned, tend to have little awareness of their disease. Um, therefore, bringing external help is sometimes easier than in Alzheimer's disease, where there's this period where the person might deny they have a disease and resist help. In FTD, if you have someone who is very passive, you can bring someone from the CLSC, or a community organism and you know, okay, fine, there's this new person coming in the house and, and that can go pretty, uh, pretty smoothly. Now the trade-off, uh, if we talk about CLSC services is that because these patients have mostly behavioral issues, sometimes uh, uh, families have a, a bad experience where they're told where there's not really any any needs that we can provide because it's it's not bathing, it's not medication, it's not uh, moving someone from one room to another. It's it's just spending time with the person. And, right, and that often like the a, mental health relief for the caregiver. Right? Ex exactly, and, and and sometimes that's that's an essential service, but that's not always provided depending on. The, on uh, which uh, local support system. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Ducharme, thank you so much for taking the time with us today. We really appreciate. Uh, and Pleasure. I think your, the big message is become as educated as possible and seek support early, yeah. correct? Uh, yes, absolutely. And, and there is hope. Uh, there are some treatments, particularly for the genetic forms that are quite advanced and that might be coming, um, I would say in the next, four to five years. And this might be a complete game changer for the, the genetic groups. Uh, it might even uh, hmm. significantly delay or if not, maybe even prevent disease. Uh, so we, we are currently doing studies to test that type of medications. Um, so there is hope. There is hope. Well, thank you so much for taking the time uh, with us today. Um, please join me on Wednesday, April 21st, when I'll be joined by some of the editors and authors of The Care of the Older Person. My guests will include Dr. Ronald Kaplan, Dr. Abraham Pukes, Dr. Serge Gauthier, and Dr. José Moret, who will discuss their contributions to the fourth edition of this invaluable resource for those who provide care to seniors. Once again, this webcast is an initiative of the McGill Dementia Education Program, which is funded by private donations. I would like to sincerely thank the Lindsay Memorial Foundation for supporting today's webcast. If you would like to make a contribution to our program or for more information, please visit us at mcgill.ca slash dementia. And if you would like to join our mailing list to be updated on all the upcoming webcasts and events that we are doing, please email us at dementia at mcgill.ca. Thank you for watching. Thank you.